Personally, I rather like soft furnishings, but there's more to heritage than buildings, landmarks and monuments. A new museum in Ditchling, Sussex, aims to showcase the unique history of a village that set out to preserve an entire way of life. Michael Smith went along to find out how a group of art purists created their own utopia at the foot of the South Downs. Ditchlin may seem like a typical Sussex village, but there's more to this place than meets the eye. A creative legacy is woven into this community that reaches back nearly a hundred years. In a time when society was reeling from the horrors of the First World War, the Catholic Guild of St Joseph and St Dominic was set up here on Ditchlin Common. Their philosophy was anti-industrialisation and anti-mechanisation, and the idea that craft was pure and handmade was sacred to them. The Guild had a motto, men rich in virtue, studying beautifulness, living in peace in the houses. Now, I don't know about you, but there's just something a bit worthy and smug about that. It's that sense of we turned our back on modern life because we found a better alternative when really you're just down the road from London and all your wealthy customers. There's a hypocrisy in that. But, to be fair, some days I wish I could block out all the chatter and fluster of modern life. Go off grid, or at least off line. So I've come to see the legacy of these artists. You never know, I might even fall in love with this version of the good life. The artist and poet David Jones joined this community in the 1920s. Former Guild member and calligrapher Ewan Clayton now lives in Jones's old house, where the previous owner has left his mark. Come in, Michael. Okay. So this is the, the mural in my kitchen, <laughs> which David Jones painted in 1923 when he moved into the house. Right. It was completely painted over in the 50s, and they thought it was ruined. But we rediscovered it about 20 years ago when we were redecorating and suddenly wow. peeling off paint, one of these oh, eyes yeah. appeared oh. <laughs> and we realised it was still there, yeah. which is fantastic. David Jones came to Ditchlin having spent three years in the trenches. After that, it's not surprising he wanted to shut himself away from the modern world and devote himself to God and art. So what do you think life was like then for David Jones? I think it was quite tough, but their whole idea was that they would accept the work that they felt was right and turn down work that they didn't. So they tried to be as self-sufficient as they could. Yeah. So they had a certain freedom in their work, and that's what they wanted. They wanted freedom to follow their own conscience. To me, it seemed it's a bit sort of ostrich-like to kind of turn your back on yeah. the outside world. How do you think they would see that? Well, I think, actually, if one looks at the history of that period, this wasn't an unusual thing. There were small mm. communities in lots of parts of this country who were separating out in order to experiment with slightly different ways of living, mm. like the Bloomsbury Group, not very far from here, too. So, mm. actually, it was, it was part of the times, and I don't think they would have thought they were ostrich-like. When you glimpse this way of life from the inside and feel the genuine enthusiasm of people like Ewan, who was connected to the Guild, you can't help but feel a bit less cynical about it all. However, I'm still not convinced about Ditchlin's most famous artist, whose dark secrets would later confound the people here. Eric Gill was one of the founding figures of this artistic community. He lived here in this farmhouse. Now, I find it really hard to shake the feeling he was just this kind of sandal-wearing tyrant who just couldn't get along with the rest of the world. So he created this kind of rigid and extreme version of Utopia instead. The fact he slept with his sisters, his daughters, and even the family dog only adds to the suspicion. The lurid details of Eric Gill's private life came out in 1989, when a biography including his diaries was published. But this doesn't seem to have tarnished Ditchland's reputation as a craft haven a place fighting to keep hold of its heritage in face of the overwhelming forces of modern blandness. The silver shop on the high streets run by Anton Pruden, 
whose grandfather, Dunstan Pruden, like Eric Gill and David Jones, was one of the original Guild members. This is some figurative work of my grandfather's, around 1930s. So what do you think you learnt from your grandfather? I remember being incredibly impressed by the workshop, although a bit overawed. Bench work was the absolute basis to everything. Not over-finishing, not being over-concerned with it as a commercial finished product. Hammering but leaving the hammer marks in is a good example. So it's that kind of very basic but excellent craftsmanship. You're using this sort of heritage as a USP. Is, is that a bit ironic, considering how the Guild was sort of anti-commercial? 